phone, telegraph, radio, or cable of dispatches, messages, and conversations originating within the United States. Messages transmitted from a point within the United States to a point without the United States are subject to the provisions of the Act unless sent with charges reversed or collect. Messages transmitted from a point without the United States to a point within the United States are not subject to the tax unless sent with charges reversed or collect. Now, you can go through all of these regulations that relate to this particular tax in an effort to find a clear and express provision that tells you where it applies. <laughs> and my suggestion to you is, is that that's what you see in yellow is all that there is. Now, from reading what appears in yellow, can you reach a conclusion about how the tax applied, who it applied to? Was it even internal? Didn't it require crossing the borders? You said up front here. Absolutely. Did everybody reach that, that conclusion? Okay. So regulations can be real important. Now, let's, let's go back to the... Um, can I get to do an introduction here for a second or not? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead, up? Steve. <laughs> I think everybody's here. What's that? Did you say? Take off. Oh, Take okay. Off. <laughs> uh, this was Larry's suggestion to do this kind of researcher meeting. We have two attorneys here, John Green and Larry B. Craft. But uh, for the rest of you, I gave you a form. And my, my idea is that we should network better around the country. <laughs> And there's people researching, and some of you in here might be the, some of the best researchers in the country, but mo nobody knows you. So our hope is to gather your names, and you don't, this form is voluntary, we're not the government here. If you consider yourself a researcher, paralegal, or, or you're a liberty-minded attorney, you want to build a network of some sort, so when you're researching something or having a problem, you can go out to others and talk to them, maybe video conference with them, or get documents from them. If you think that's a good idea, you may want to fill this form out. I know I talked to John and Larry, they like the idea. so. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, so we, I ran out of name tags for those who don't have any. So. Uh, but they're going to, I'm going to just turn the meeting over to Larry. This is a $20 donation. It's rolling formal today. If you, if you can do it, bring it by sometime today. Uh, we just want to pay for the room. And uh, I hope you get something out of it. Steve's got a, a, available back there a, a, a CD. And I want to explain what's on it. You know, here, this is kind of an introduction to what's on the, the CD, but what you will find here is that all of the, virtually all of the ma major tax acts are on this disc, <coughs> along with the relevant regulations. So, for example, you know, the first one that's here is the Revenue Act of 1918. And, of course, you can, with the statutes at large, this was compiled you know, I personally did all this. You know, I had somebody scan and convert to text, you know, this stuff right here. And I went line by line by line through all these acts to make sure that they're correct. And so here you have the text conversion of the Revenue Act of 1918. And it's all word <coughs> searchable. Uh, let's see how you... Well, let's, let's not do it for right now. And it's real important, in my view, for people to be conversant with the pattern that you run across when you start uh, looking at the, the, the tax laws. This Revenue Act of 1918, let's see, maybe I passed. It should be in Section 210. Ah, now we're getting out of the tax. In lieu of the tax imposed by Subdivision A of Section 1 of the Revenue Act of 1916 and by Section 1 of the Revenue Act of 1917, there shall be levied, collected, and paid in lieu of? Okay, so what, what's happening here? They're saying that they impose, you know, if you go back to Revenue Act of 1916 and Section 1 of the Revenue Act of 1917, the Revenue Act of 1916 imposed the tax, Revenue Act of 1917, Section 1 amended it. And so you had, as a result of by, by 1918, you had, in effect, those two acts which imposed a tax. Now they're coming along and saying, oh, well, you know, that, that tax is still in effect, but in lieu of the, that tax, we're, we're establishing this new one with these new rates. Can you see that? In lieu of. 
Now let's go down to 21. 10, we go there. In lieu of, in layman's terms, means. In lieu of. Instead of. Instead of, in yeah. In place of. Mm -hmm. John, read that. Normal tax, section 210, that, that in lieu of the tax imposed by section 210 of the Revenue Act of 1918, there shall be levied, collected, and paid for each taxable year upon the net income of every individual a normal tax of 8% per percentum of the amount of the net income in excess of the credits provided in section 216. All right, so at this, even here in 1921, Whatever was in the, the whatever tax was imposed in 1916, the Revenue Act of 1918 comes along and says, "Well, in lieu of that tax, it's still upon the same thing, right? With the exception, you know, now they're monkeying with the rates. Would you agree?" And so here we are in 1921. Oh, the 21 tax was in lieu of the 1918 tax which was in lieu of the 1916 and 1917 tax. Can you see that? Twenty-four. So in the disk, the, the, the acts switch to the statutes at large, Larry? No, the, the, all the acts are in the statutes at large. Right, I know yeah. that you got it. And this is pulled from the statutes at large, and we're, we're, we're not here uh, dealing with uh, Title 26, at least not yet. Now, John, you want to read it again? If you make it bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Normal tax, Section 210. A, in lieu of the tax imposed by Section 210 of the Revenue Act of 1921, there shall be levied, collected, and paid for each taxable year upon the net income of every individual, except as provided in subdivision B of this section, a normal tax of 6% of the amount of the net income in excess of the credits provided in two six, section 216. Good enough, good enough. Now, can you see it's in lieu of? Mm -hmm. So here you, if you were, let's say it's 1925, you're gonna sit down and look at the federal income tax. <coughs> you're gonna turn to this 1924 act and say, oh, it's in lieu of. Well, then you in lieu of the 21. So you turn back to the 21, and you'd read section 210 of the 21, and you'd, oh, that's in lieu of the one in 18, 1918. So you turn back to the one in 1918, oh, that's in lieu of the 1916, 1917. That's what you would do, would, would you not? You're all replacing the previous one. Yeah. I'll explain to you later why this was done. <coughs> Oops. Section 210, John. Normal tax, Section 210A, in lieu of the tax imposed by Section 210 of the Revenue Act of 1924, there shall be levied, collected, and paid for each taxable year upon the net income of every individual, except as provided in Subdivision B of this section, a normal <coughs> tax of 5% percentum of the amount of the <coughs> in excess of the credits provided in Section 216. Okay. So we're seeing that they're monkeying with the percentage, right? And it, it, here in the tax and post section, they're plainly telling you it's in lieu of, right? And so you can see a direct connection all the way back. Now, the format changes in 1928. This is the structure that ultimately goes into the 1939 code. Section 11 is now the place where you find Tax imposed. John? 
God. Section 11, normal tax on individuals. There shall be levied, collected, and paid for each taxable year upon the net income of every individual a normal tax equal to the sum of the following. Does it have in lieu of here? No. So now somebody coming along in 1928, they open up the tax code, boom, there shall be levied. Now, if you limited your, oh, well, I'm going to form my opinion about this tax just based on Section 11, you're going to miss something, will you not? And doesn't they, isn't the taxable year a new term as well? Well, uh, I, we could go back up to the definitions. Uh, but, hey, you know, you can, you can see these terms. A lot of these terms that you see in the current code, they go back. <laughs> Start off in 1918. Yeah, a little bit. But half the people don't pay income tax, so they don't have taxable years. Yeah. Now let's go down to, most people would sit there and say, oh, you know, all I need to know is take a look at tax imposed. What Congress did is they carved out, in lieu of, stuck it someplace else. Boom, there it is. They carved it out of, tax imposed, stuck it over here in section 63. Now you don't, you don't see, you know, unless you read along with law, you're unaware of the taxes imposed by this title shall be in lieu of the corresponding taxes imposed by Title II of the Revenue Act 1926, according to the following section. In section <coughs> 211, we're in lieu of 210. So these, now, now you've got something a little bit different. You have, let's go down to 11. Well, if you're in 1933 and you had a business and, whoa, now you're hearing, uh, gee, what about this federal income tax? If you make so much money, you may not, may be required to file a return. Or if you're a new accountant, you graduated a couple years before and you're beginning to, oh, what about this tax? You're going to start looking. And how many people are going to sit out and look at the whole blooming thing? They're going to sit there and look at Section 11. Ooh. Every individual, I'm an individual. And they're going to limit their inquiry to just this. Is that correct? Yes. Natural human tendency. However, flip past it. Section 63. Taxes imposed by this title shall be in lieu of the corresponding taxes imposed by the sections of the Revenue Act, bearing the same numbers. But now it's in lieu of. Still in lieu of. So the 32 tax, even though it's a little bit harder to find now, the 32 tax was in lieu of the 28 tax, 28 was in lieu of 26, 26 was in lieu of 24, 24 was in lieu of 21, 21 was in lieu of the Revenue Act of 1918, which was in lieu of 1916 and 1917. Is this, are they making it a little bit more complicated? Number 34. So it's 1935. You're an accountant. You buy from the Bureau of Internal Revenue, tax code. You see the table of contents, you open it up, boom. Well, there, there's a tax on individuals. And I'm only going to look here. Why should it go anywhere else? The problem is, There's a problem. 
taxes in both of those titles shall be in lieu of the corresponding taxes in both of the Revenue Act of 32. So 34 was in lieu of 32, 32 in lieu of 28, 28 was in lieu of 26, 26 was in lieu of 24, 24 in lieu of 21, 21 in lieu of 18, in lieu of 1916, 1917. So is it all kind of connected? Nineteen thirty six. Here's our section eleven. Read it, Bob. I don't have my reading glasses, I'll try. There shall be levy. Oh, you're like me, you can't see. <laughs> and pay for each taxable year. Upon the net income of every individual, <coughs> normal tax of four percentum of the amount of the net income of, in excess of the credits against net income provided in section 25. Wow, so you're going to sit there, you're curious, this tax is growing and you're hearing more about this tax, better look into it. And so you turn to, you know, you get a little booklet from the Bureau of Internal Revenue, you start looking around. Ooh, look at this section 11. Well, all I need to do is just read this little booklet of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, right? But then not the whole thing, right? Right. You, wow, there's a tax imposed. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look at the instruction booklet because they're reproducing the rate. <coughs> and, and the history's going to be ignored. History was being ignored at that time. Did you you scroll past every? I caught every person libel really quick. Well, we we, we can we do that for a minute. Listen, I want to tell you that things a step at a time. Okay. Here we go. Taxes in lieu of 34. Agreed? So why why did they, was there some purpose in, you know, carving out the in lieu of feature? Hey, when you, in 1924, you see tax imposed, you were put on notice. Well, it was in lieu of. Now they carve out and stick in lieu of over in section 63. They hide it. All right. So this is 36, let's go down to 38. And of course that HTML file that you, if you get the disk, you know it's gonna look a little bit different than what, what we're looking at here on the screen. But here we are in 1938. Section 11, normal tax on individuals. There shall be levied, collected, and paid for each taxable year upon the net income of every individual, a normal tax of 4% on the amount of the net income in excess of the credits against net income provided in Section 25. Well, what, do you think most people at that stage, you know, hear that they're hearing about this tax? <coughs> you know, you're a vice president of some large manufacturing company. Last year you didn't pay any income tax, but this year, you know, you're hearing that, oops, oh, good grief, I'm sorry. I moved, so. Disconnected from your project, oh. there we go. Yeah. So you never paid a federal income tax, so you, you run to your friend that happens to be an accountant, he's been an accountant for 10 years, He's beginning to hear about this uh, tax, and he's might have heard some other accountants talking about this tax, you know, that didn't affect a whole lot of people except the higher echelons of society. And so you look into it, and ooh, you're, you, there aren't any schools that are going to teach you about this. You know, you're just going to pick up a booklet and form your own opinion as an accountant. 
or as a, an executive of a large company, right? And you're gonna, whoa, well, hey, that, that answers all my questions right there, section 11. Did that happen? And uh, Capone got convicted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, woke yeah, up yeah. a lot of people up. Or got their attention, rather, I should say. But that wasn't for income tax. That was for alcohol violations. Well, it, it involved income tax. He was gunned down for, bought down for income but because he yeah, made alcohol. Based on the bootlegging. Yeah, his activities were bootlegging. Yeah. Yeah. Which we passed. That important section. There it is. 1938, in Lua. And most people would, you know, since they're just beginning to get into this, they're not gonna try to study it and, you know, it's just creeping up on people. And most people are not going to, well, in lieu of, even if they ran across section 63, so what? They're going to look at the current one. And there's a tax imposed on every individual. Now, in, in December of 1938, <coughs> you had a whole bunch of tax laws that are appeared all throughout the United States Statute of Large. You had Title 26 in effect at that time. In 1926, we came out with the, the current, uh, the, you know, the law that established the 50 titles of the U.S. Code that we presently use. And, uh, you know, if you went and took a look at, and, and it's on, I'll show you all, this, this might be a good spot to look at that. Isn't this the beginning of the administrative law? Well, the Administrative Procedures Act came along in, in 1946. Let me show you what <clears throat> Title 26 looks like. This is on all of that disc back here. Here we go. In 1920, as of, well, it says December 7th of 1925, you know. <clears throat> Title 18. Ooh, Title 26. You want to see what Title 26 looked like in 1926? Oops, passed. Now down to Indians. Seen Title 26 in 1926? It's the way they divided it up. <coughs> you know, they, they, like Chapter 18, Income Tax, uh, Chapter 1, uh, Commissioner of Internal Revenue, Special Taxes, Chapter 4, Chapter is at 11, Opium, Cocoa, Leaves, is that what it says? And something else. Compounds. Compounds. And manufacturers. Yeah. <laughs> so what they were doing back then is, you know, of course this was a reflection, you know, this is if you brought everything up to the way it looked like on a certain date, all the internal revenue laws, and put them into a pattern, this is what it would look like. Of course, it's, it had a different structure than the tax law itself. Most people are probably going to sit there and look at uh, Title 26. You go to the law library, here's the title 26, this is what you're going to see. Uh, you know, we're, we're not going to have the time to dig into this, but in reference to the income tax, which would be down there in chapter uh, 11, or what is it, 18? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 18. Um, 
It would be the two acts. You know, like you, you, if you, you were looking at 1937, if you were looking at Title 26, what it looked like then, you would have in one, set, one, one half of that chapter would be the <laughs> 1936 tax, and the other half would be the 1934 tax. But as you've seen, you know, that's not the whole thing. The whole thing would be all the acts. In fact, in fact, my disc back there is closer to being a real reflection of Title 26 than, than what you see here or what you see in the current code. So I just I digress for a minute. That's what it looked like. But now let's get back to the CD. So at that point in time, you've seen it. What Title Twenty Six looked like at, at one stage you know, in 1926. You got some idea, and I've explained it to you. You've seen that we've got all this. In, 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 there's an interrelationship. You know, there's a, a connection between. You know, really, in 19, if you were in December 1938, if you really wanted to understand all of the income tax laws. You wouldn't just focus in on the Revenue Act of 1938, but you know if you really did something, you'd oh well, it's it, this is built on the 36 tax, and then you get back to the 36 tax. Oh, it's built on the 34, and 34 is built on 32, 32 is built on 28, 28 is built on 26, 26 is built on 24, 24 is built on 21, 21 is built on 18, which is based on 16 and 17. So if you really wanted to follow it forward, you 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 really needed to. As the Supreme Court has said, perhaps in, re in reference to federal stuff, uh, you, you got to construe the tax laws in para materia, which means don't look at the present. You got to construe the whole shooting match all at once. And if you don't look at the the whole shooting match all at once, and you only, only focus on the present, what you know, what's right here, don't you think you might miss something? Pretty big rabbit hole. Yeah. Okay. So now let's 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 deal with the thirty nine code. February 1939, you had all these, you had tax on white phosphorus matches imposed in, say, 1934, you know, state and get imposed in 1928, you know, <coughs> tax on uh, wine, you know, all, they're all over the place. And it wasn't codified. So what Congress did, and, and there's various arguments about the 39 code, which I think are incorrect, because I've actually been to Washington, D.C., been to archives, pulled out the enrolled bill for the 39 code, and it's the printed version. You know, what, what passed through Congress was they had already printed the sucker up. It was the bound book that you see in the law library, and I got a copy of one of those. But I went there and I, you know, I was looking for the signatures, you know, uh, bills that are filed uh, with the, uh, uh, the Secretary of State to uh, be the permanent keeper of all the laws. You know, when you go and pull out the, the law that, for the 39 code, it's that bound book and it's signed. You can see FDR signature and President Senate and you know, all the signatures are there on that printed book. So the bill, I'm sorry, I keep. <clears throat> the bill itself was that book. And, and, and a lot of people want to sit there and say, well, you know, gee, the, there's, you know, the 39 code. Uh, repealed all the underlying law. Well, yeah, that's true. But the, this act also, everything that was contained in this law that was passed by Congress, it was in some prior law, it was repealed, and all of the then existing tax laws, then in effect, were now put into one spot, one title, which makes sense to me. <coughs> Consolidate them. And that's what you have with the 39 code. So now let's, <coughs> let's examine the 39 code. It's maybe boring, but there's a point. Here we are, table of contents. Now section 11 of the Revenue Act of 19... 38 became section 11 of the 39 code. Well, the 38 act was, had a section 63 in lieu of, remember that? Mm -hmm. 
and everything that got pulled from some prior act result was repealed. If it was contained in here, <clears throat> and it was also in a prior law, it was the prior law was repealed, making this the embodiment of the law. So here we have section 11 of the 38 Act goes into section 11 of the 39 Code. But what about in lieu of? real close. There's old section 61. There's section 62. Lo and behold, there's section 63. Does it say in lieu of? So section 63 from the 38 Act still is one of those things <laughs> sitting out there unrepealed. In fact, that's the publication of statistics that's stuck there in section 63 comes from I think in 1926 or 1928 Act, you know, you can get the, you can get the derivation tables. You know, pull out the 39 code. It has the derivation tables. It'll tell you, the, you know, the, the table itself will say this section comes from, you know, this law. And so if we were to look at that section 63 right here, where it came from, off the top of my head, I remember it came from some 1926 or 1928, you know, other <coughs> other law. So section 63 didn't make it into the 39 code and therefore section 63 of the 38 act wasn't repealed, was it? Is it hidden someplace else? Still, it's still sitting there, you know, it's section 63. It's not in, there. It's not in here someplace else? No, it's not in here anywhere. So section 63 still sits there today. And of course it makes all the sense in the world because, you know, the, the 38 act was dependent upon all those others and if you're going to codify the laws into one one act, you know, uh, you could have stuck section 63 here, and then you would let the world know. But then that's not essential. That since they didn't, it just simply means that section 63 of the 1938 Act still exists unrepealed today. Okay. Does that mean it's valid? What? Does that mean it's valid? Yeah, yeah it's still. Mm -hmm. It's just an odd feature of the law, but I mean, how many people are going to sit there and you know, dig through all this stuff to see it? Most people are going to sit there, I'm going to deal with the 86 code. And, you know, and, and this is a real problem. I talked to people in the tax movement. Right. John Cobbard's a good friend of mine, SAP. Well, I, I never heard of all this stuff. I just deal with the 86 code or the 54 code. How many people in the movement even look beyond the Get your code, says Erwin. Hey, you can buy your code tab from me. Look, all you need to do is just study the code. Well, you know, you can reach certain conclusions by the code. But then again, you know, if you only do that, if you ignore history, what's the old adage that goes along with that? Doomed to repeat. Doomed to repeat. Doomed to repeat. Oh. And I've just seen too many times that being doomed to repeat <coughs> it has, is a very expensive lesson. Screw you back in, they'll screw you twice. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so now, let's deal with. Oh, gee. Should have done that. <clears throat> okay, we're at the 39 code. And here we are that had the 54 code, which is also a text conversion. Now this is the way, you know, from uh, February 1939, the 39 code was in effect. And in August of 1954, they were wanting to come out with the 54 code. A lot of people are gonna sit there, you know, they're in this movement, you can hear all sorts of wild tales. <clears throat> but what is the 54 code? Well, the 54 code, imagine this. There's, here's a, putting it into illustrative examples. What is the 54 code? Imagine the 1939 code, the way it existed, the way it looked in August of 1954. 
you know, it was the 39 code as it was originally enacted. There were a whole bunch of amendments in the intervening 15 years. You know, Congress would come along and amend section, you know, 114 to read thus and such, or 119 to read thus and such, you know, add a word here and subtract a word there. You know, there were a bunch of amendments. <clears throat> They're always tinkering with it. But the, uh, even though they tinker with it, still the basic features, you know, who's subject to it remains the same. <clears throat> but imagine that 54 code, uh, it being created from the 39 code, and what they did is take the, 50, the 39 <clears throat> code the way it looked in August of 1954, take some scissors to it, cut up the sections, and so you have one piece of paper has one section, which you know, you know some of these sections would be that long. <clears throat> but then come along and cut up some of those sections into subsections, and now you got a whole bunch more of little pieces of paper. Now reshuffle it. You, now you got all these pieces of paper. Shuffle it like a deck of cards into a new format, and, and then even make some word changes. But the 54 code, the way it had, is equal in meaning to the 39 code after it was cut up, reshuffled, re, the words changed. You know, the government says, Congress says, it's still the same thing. That's the 54 code. So now you have the 54 code. <coughs> you know, the, remember you have the Section 63 of the 38 Act, even in, at this stage, is still sitting out there. And of course, the 54 code, which is this, <coughs> looks, it looks entirely different. In fact, you know, let's just take one example. Let's go back to that 39 code. Pull up section 22. Even past it. Okay, look at nice. section 22. <laughs> <clears throat> Gross income includes gains, profits, and income. Derived. Now, most people are going to look at that sentence. <clears throat> income is the gains and profits, which are a part of, not the totality <coughs> of, salaries, wages, and compensation. Is that a more accurate reading of that? If income is derived from salaries, then not all salaries are income, right? Not all wages are income. Am I, am I correct? <coughs> you see that point? Any questions? It's but why intentionally it, confusing. Huh? It's intentionally confusing. Well, it's intentionally complex. So the confusion is created. I call, oh. it, I call it government by indirection. Yeah. Good, good, good observation, John. But I, I got this, you know, let, let's take, this is something I think is real important and I was talking about it yesterday. You know, you have these statutory definitions. You know, like, uh, let's say, to use an example, uh, you know, animal. Animal in this law means a dog, a cat, a horse, and a cow. Okay? And I think y'all have agreed with me that a dog and a cat are two different things, even though they're animals, subsets of animals. But wouldn't you think the same thing here? That, you know, as a matter of law, a salary is, you know, put, put a dog there and under wages put cat there. And salaries and wages is just, are as different as a dog and a cat, right? They are two different things. Would you agree? Then that makes, what's that next phrase? Compensation for personal services is a little bit different.
Now let's go to. Now, when when what's real handy is to there's a committee report. You know, the Senate and the House each came up with committee reports regarding uh, the 54 code. And you sit there, they have a section by section analysis. And I might have it here on my computer, but you know, I, I can't find it real quick. But when you read the section 61 analysis, you know, it would say, oh, well, you know, <clears throat> while we've changed the word to simplify, uh, changed the word to simplify, it's still as a matter of law, section 21, I mean, section 22 is equal to section 61 of the, of the code. Of, but now, do, do you think that there are, even though as a matter of law, says Congress, Section 22 equals Section 61, doesn't it look different? Yes. And if you ignored the history, will you not look at this and come away with something entirely different in the way of an impression? You know, I would look at Section 22 and say, oh, income compensation for services is the source for gains or profits, right? Yep. But now you're going to come along and, oh, we've simplified it. Yeah, you've simplified it <clears throat> to imply something else. Is that right, Steve? And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? You see wages and salaries there? Is it there? Now, let's go to something else. <coughs> uh, years ago, 20 or 30 years ago, a friend of mine from, from Dallas was chancing and reading some of the old regulations and he ran across what you know has, has now been popularized by other people. <clears throat> this is from Regs 45, which would be for the Revenue Act of 1918. And guess what we see there? Gross income excludes items of income specifically exempt by statute and also certain other kinds of income by statute or fundamental law, free for tax. So here when you have a, you know, the theme of the tax laws is first, first let's determine what net income is, and from net income, you know, taxable income is derived. So the all the way up to the 39 code, the concept of the tax law was, well, we're, while we're only taxing taxable income, to arrive at taxable income, we must, must first determine net income. But then again, some of that net income may be exempt by statute or fundamental law, right? Yeah. That's what it says. Reg 62, which would be... Okay, Article 71 again. Something's excluded. The gross income excludes the items of income specifically exempted by statute and also certain other kinds of income by statute or fundamental law, free from tax. <coughs> Five. Again, Article 61. 65 would be, I think, off the top of it. I don't have it here. I think this is for the 1924 Act. The term gross income, as used in this act, does not include those items of income exempted by statute or by fundamental law. 69. Are all these laws still active today? No, these, the, the, what I'm showing you here are the regulations. You know, oh, we've, been, we've already been through, you know, the various acts. And, you know, yeah. we didn't descend to that, but the acts themselves would sit there and say, and, oh, and the commissioner, <coughs> in, in conjunction with the Secretary of the Treasury, can promulgate you know, regulations. Are the regulations still active? This is, this is a set of regulations. This is 69. And they and you watch them, you know, you, and they keep growing and growing and growing. And, and, but hey, you know, you keep seeing the same old words that are used all over again. Can but, one refer to them as existing regulations? These are not existing. They're not. This is historical. Okay. And they're all, they're all on that desk. You know, let me, 
what what benefit would they be if they're not? Uh, the reason that they're beneficial <laughs> is because of that adage that we've been talking about. If you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. And history is a great teacher. And see, here you have it. You know, here you have on this disc. Here are the link, you know, if you pull up the HTML file, the laws, the folder laws, well, here, here are all those tax acts. And, but then again, the, the regulations are here. Regulations 45 for the 1918 Act, uh, regulations 45 for the 19, for the amended 1920, Reg 62, you know, all of these, you know, all these were, you know, we've been through the acts and here are the regulations that would be adopted by the commissioner and the and the secretary of the treasury for, for each specific act. You know, like Reg 77, I think, would apply to the 1932 act. I've got a disc that you published, I guess it was in conjunction with We the People. Okay. A lot of information is still yeah, yeah, yeah. accurate. Yeah, you know, I... You add stuff and you subtract stuff. I can't tell you what, you know, for, for a number of years, what you're seeing right here is the way I've distributed it. Reg 63, Regs 103 is for the 39 code. Regs 101 is for the, the 1938 Act. Regs 94 is for the 36 Act. Uh, Regs 86 is for 32, 28, 26, 24. Is there any sequence or 21? behind the uh, correlation of numbers, like you're saying. Yeah, like because you know you got to go. You got to go back. Things were simpler then. <coughs> Congress had passed the law, and you know, like like uh, hey, oh maybe I can show. Let's we'll see. Um, I might have some here. So the secretary decided to issue a new set of regs for. A specific well, a new act would come out, and he would. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Does each secretary ah, rewrite his, his regulations? Or? Okay, wait, just wait, wait, wait. Okay. All right, here we go. Look. Okay. Yeah. In the in a simpler time, you know, like the, these regs T, uh, TD thirty or let's see, this related to oleo margarine. So regs thirty four were for uh, the oleo margarine tax for uh, that was in effect in January nineteen twenty. Regs 36 related to cotton, you know, and, and, and you can see I, I stuck the word in here to, you know, for my own purposes, you know, I can see that Regs 38 related to the corporate excise tax, Regs 39 related to the emissions tax, Regs 40 related to the stamp tax, Regs 40 also dealt with the stock tax, uh, excess profits, uh, dues, emissions and dues, that's really important though, that was a tax, go to the theater, a cabaret, and there was a tax, and all of this. And so, you know, here you go. The, you know, the, the commissioner comes along, and when Congress, right here, Regs 43 revised applies to Part One related to the tax on emissions imposed by Title Eight of the Revenue Act of 1918, approved February 24th of 1919. And this, all this came about because of the 16th Amendment. No, the, no. This, this this 16th Amendment only related to the to the income tax, and you know, emissions and dues doesn't have anything to do with income. It was uh, if you were going into uh, a theater. Are these excises then? Well, well the, uh, the courts would construe a tax upon the admission to a theater as certainly being an excise tax. And you have to look, look, here's tax on sodas, which was Regs 44. Regs 46, child, child labor, which was declared unconstitutional. Uh, sales, so you had a whole bunch of sales taxes. You know, and I've just, uh, transportation, that's the regulations 48 related to transportation. Regs 48, excuse me, Regs 49 dealt with that. This one deals with art and jewelry. Toiletries, Regs 51. So, you, you know, you can see sodas, clothes, Regs 54 dealt with clothes. So I see that this imposes a lot of taxes, but it doesn't necessarily establish liability of those taxes. That's by the pay Well, by you the have person. to, you, each, each act, you know, you have to, we're concerned with the income tax. In the past, you know, before Congress became dependent upon uh, income taxes, you know, you had taxes imposed on a wide variety of things. You've seen some of the titles. 
And so, you know, you go back through and you know, states and gifts, it, it, is this toiletries? No, this is motion picture films. And so, you know, they have tried various taxes and Hey, look at what the, or here, here's radio transmissions, which we incidentally covered a minute ago, starting out this morning. Let's see, insurance, no tax on insurance. You know, so they, they have just booze. Here's the regs, reg 60 dealt with booze. Is that what they called it? They called it no, that's, that's, that? that's just my handy term. Oh, okay. Can you see that? Yeah, I, I put regs 59, which is Treasury Decision 2983, and I, that is my own word there when I name the file, so that I can have a general idea as to what I'm looking at. That's right, you said it okay? earlier. You know, so it, you know, uh, to me, alcohol is booze. I think a lot of people call it booze, although this file happens to be called alcohol. It may be, it may be a different. This may be the alcohol they drink. This may be denatured or something like that. Let's see what it is. Yeah, denatured alcohol. Okay. People used to drink that too. Yep. Give tax. You know, so you've had a wide variety of taxes that have been imposed. Perfumes. Look, here's perfumes. You know, geez. Yes, Treasury Decision 2063. It is 11 pages long, or maybe a little less. But there it is. That creates a lot of government jobs. Yep. They pass a lot of laws and they write a lot of regulations. Yeah. You know, here, oh, oh, here, let me. Let me yeah, well, we don't have the time to do it, but you know, I, it, now that we're in this, happen to be in this folder. <clears throat> remember, I started off and I was explaining to you, you know, you look at the regulations, and you know, gee, they, they, you know, here's the one spot where it seems to tell you exactly how it applies. But then you've also gone, we've gone through this, and, and the boat example is a real good reason. <clears throat> if we have the time to go through and show you the infinite details of the boat regs. Uh, but this explains, in my view, it's a real good illustration of explaining why they use this in lieu of trick. And they've been using it, you know, that some inventive genius in the Treasury Department came up with it probably in the 1860s, 1870s. But, you know, uh, in 1909, uh, Congress passed a tax on farm bill yachts. You know, obviously designed for your Morgans, your, your Vanderbilts, and the Rockefellers, and people like that. And of course, those people initiated a lawsuit and uh, <coughs> went all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, Justice Flight comes out in the, you know, the case dealing with tax on foreign bill yachts and justifies it. It's, of course, it's constitutional. And incidentally, in that, in that decision, White says, you know, there's a difference between things domestic and things foreign and their use. And that's inherent in the Constitution. Whoa, that, I think it's a pretty profound statement. It's inherent in the Constitution, something, the difference between things domestic and things foreign and their use, and they're sitting there dealing with the tax on, imposed on foreign-built yachts. But I digress. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you take a look at that boat tax, you know, I call it, you can see I call it boats. Uh, Yachts would call boats back then. That was full of. You know, here, it, it, after the Supreme Court justified the, the, and determined to be constitutional, I got boats, okay, this is. Yacht or boat. Yachts, pleasure boats, power boats, motor boats with fixed engines and sailing boats over five net tons, length not over 50 feet. <coughs> well, you know, when you. Congress, uh, after the first tax was upheld, now they come along in lieu of. Well, in lieu of the, the tax, which incidentally the Supreme Court found to be constitutional and it declared, declared to be an excise tax, in lieu of that tax, we hear about post this tax. <clears throat> and if you're looking at the if you're looking at the law itself, there doesn't seem to be any apparent connection to foreign. But you descend into the regulations, and boom. You see a real clear description that's far. And so, you know, I use the boat example as a real good example of uh, why they use the Alua feature. Make something, you got a very limited constitutional tax, you want to make it look bigger? Hey, pull a little trick. In Lua. 
and then you know then then hide it in history. And of course, the people people never learn from experience. People never learn from history, so they can ignore history just like we have done. And they're not going to go back into, and they're not going to see. They're not going to see what we were on a minute ago. Let me go back to where we were. We were at here. Reg 65. Article 71. I think we covered this one. Reg 69. The term gross income is used in this act does not include those items of income exempted by statute or by fundamental law. Uh. Term gross income as used in this act does not include those items of income exempted by statute or by fundamental law. 77. Same thing, doesn't it? Fundamental law. <coughs> well, what is what the world is fundamental law? <coughs> well, common law, constitutional law. It's, it's different there. Oh, yeah. 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 <coughs> Neither income exempted by statute or fundamental law, nor expenses incurred in connection therewith, or. Uh, other than interest, enter into the computation net income by section 21. Now you have another additional income not taxable by the federal government under the Constitution. Whoa. Now it's becoming a little bit more a little clearer. It looks like to me that old expression, fundamental law, <laughs> translates into this. What's that? Oh, uh, let's see. That's going to be fun. Well, that's 86 is probably going to be Revenue Act of 1934. For the rare times they use that term, I bet you. Well, we're, look, we're going to, okay, now this is 1936, so this would be uh, for the 36 tax, I think. Okay, now they're kind of expanding things. Let me blow it up here, because I'm using Federal Register pages here that Under Section 22, the exclusions from gross income. Certain items, again, come specified in Section 22B are exempt from tax and may be what? Excluded. From gross income. These items, however, are exempt only to the extent and the amount specified. No other items are exempt from gross income except those items of income which are under the Constitution not taxable by the federal government. What, what, what is that? Hey, interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, they don't tell you any place? Constitution of the West. No, well, hey, that's, that's, that's part of arguing about all this stuff. Uh, I can't see the, what section of the regulations this is. Evidently, it's uh, health care. Oh, it's Article 115. We were on that a minute ago on the other one. You know, I showed you 115 a minute ago, and now it's, it looks like, it, to me, it's kind of expanded. Now, can you see the benefit? You know, you, you look at, you know, just a minute ago, I showed you this, and it looks like you've added a few more words this time. You know, they keep, you know, add a little bit more. We, we looked at what the 115 reg a minute ago, and now we're on the, the 115 reg for the next set of regs. And it looks like, to me, they've added a few more clarifying words. Among the items entering into the computation of corporate earnings or profits for the particular period are all income exempted by statute, income not, income not taxable by the federal government under the Constitution. Corporate earnings. Okay, 116. Oh, that's state officials. bring this to your attention. Yeah. This is something that maybe that's a little bit too large. <coughs> 
Well, prior to this time, and all the way up through 34, <clears throat> what was real clear, they were taxing uh, the income of non-resident aliens not engaged in trader business here in the United States. Define trader business. I think, personally, I think trader business is something that's engaged in by, <laughs> again, you know, pay, pay, popular patriot mythology says trader business will be the performance of a government office. <clears throat> that is not borne out when you study the history. Trader business, in my view, is any trade business engaged in and carried on by non-resident alien. <coughs> even, though it, even though it's defined as a public office? In the you got the word includes. Yeah. So, <coughs> you know, it's kind of like there's a lot of people right now, you know, what is it, 74, 23, you know, Oh, you know, the tax crimes only apply to corporate officers, blah, 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 because, you know, they're using the word person. Well, you know, that argument is addressed by you got to use the, you know, 7701A1, the definitions of person. You know, that right there, that word person applies to the entire code. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we have a, a bunch of people in our community coming along and ignoring that and sitting there and saying 7423. 23, I guess that's the number, you know, it says person includes a corporate officer and they make an argument that, oh, the tax crimes only apply to a corporate officer. Well, you know, that's wrong because they're ignoring, you know, the, the definition of person in the, in the code. But, you know, one of the things that I see here, you know, you, when, they, when they came along and they, now they're expanding from a non-resident alien not engaged in trade business here in the United States now for a non-resident alien actually engaged, was engaged in trade or business within the United States, or had an office or place of business therein, you know, why does suddenly, when that happens, now you find, you know, now they expand the tax to non-resident aliens actually engaged in trade or business here in the United States, and suddenly out of the wild blue yonder, Except those items which are exempt from taxation by statute or treaty or which are not taxable by the federal government under the Constitution. A phrase you've seen before. You know, why is that? You know, may I suggest to you, I think apportionment has a direct relationship to this. Okay, let's see if there's... What's a, the, using the word means versus includes when it says government employee means or this means as opposed to this includes. Is there? Well, you know, I wouldn't want to, for any one particular thing, I wouldn't want to uh, l limit my argument based upon what you see currently. I would go back and trace it all the way forward because I mean, when you trace it forward, you know, I've just seen too many people when they limit their conclusions based on the current code and ignore history, they often reach a conclusion the exact opposite of what the truth is. The reason I and that includes professionals. We have professionals, which is tax lawyers and accountants. We have people in government that work in the tax field. You know, everybody. We're all going to deal with the, with the current. Well, they're going to reach erroneous conclusions, just like the movement's going to reach the erroneous conclusions if you ignore history. But everybody's bound and determined. Can we do that with the regs? Can we look at it? Like if 26 CFR at 6331 <coughs> four, I think it is. It says uh, federal employees, a paragraph about federal yeah, employees, and it says what Yeah, a lot of people on based on 6331 reach the conclusion based on the statute. The levy may be made on the officer employee. But you know, hey, you, you know, you, 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 will, you, will, you will not understand who an employee is <laughs> until you look at it historically. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go out and learn who an employee is. But I know the key factor here is uh, the meaning of income because historically we find that it does not mean compensation for labor, including tax wages or salaries. It meant income derived from those things, which would be uh, not the 
compensation itself, but some earnings that you might occur, occur by the Some say, gain or profit it. arising from the employment, such as, John, if your employer is paying you vacation pay and you do not have to surrender any labor to get vacation pay, could you, if you were looking at it from the viewpoint of the government, wouldn't that be a gain or profit? It could be. If you were getting sick leave, you know, you don't surrender any labor for sick leave, you know, wouldn't that, looking at it from a government viewpoint, wouldn't that be a gain or profit from <coughs> salary or wages? Well, or if uh, you were Severance due to be paid pay. by the end of the week and you weren't paid until the end of the month and the employer paid you interest on the money he borrowed from you for three weeks, uh, that interest yeah. would be income. Yeah. But not the wages themselves. Yeah. But I mean, I, I would suggest you look at what's specifically treated as at length in the regulation. The specific items under Section 61 regulations about what income is, and ooh, it's kind of. But I, hey, let's let's move on. We got here. It is 11:25, and I, I'm just simply showing to you. Here we are. The regs 101 for the 1938 Act. And again, you have this language. No other items are exempt from gross income except those items of income which are under the Constitution, not taxable by the federal government. And, you know, this. You know, in a number of places, you know, you, you see, you know, as time goes by, you know, more and more often you find more and more spots in these regulations where they're talking about this income not taxable by the federal government under the Constitution. There's one spot, and let's see, here's another spot. Oh, oh, oh you know, I, 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 nothing irritates me more than, you know, the, the uh, I don't see why state employees, nothing has changed constitutionally. And boy, this, this was an accurate statement then as well as today. Compensation of state officers and employees. Compensation received for services rendered to a state is to be included in gross income unless the person receives such compensation from the state as an officer or employee thereof, and such compensation is immune from taxation of the Constitution of the United States. And today, you know, you know, I, I don't think constitutionally a state employee can be taxed, but they don't care. A state yeah. surrender. Yeah. Here's a, again, you know, you know, once these non-resident aliens were taxed on doing business here in the United States by maintaining an office, oh, but there's something that even they do which may not be taxable by the federal government under the Constitution. I think federal, federal employees should be the only ones paying a damn tax. They're the ones getting the benefit from it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, <coughs> go back and... Go back and look at some of the old stuff about compensation for personal services. Do you think that the federal government might have even reached the conclusion that a government worker has absolutely a zero basis in what he is paid by the government? You know, under a, a, it seems like to me it's an acknowledgement that they're, they're, what, what a government employee is being paid is pure profit because they have nothing invested in it. It's, it's all gravy. Whereas I, I mean, if you if you sit down and take a look at the what they have to say about government employees in reference to compensation for personal services, you know, there's some real real interesting uh, conclusions. Uh, one conclusion being the government acknowledges that the the work of a government worker is valueless and, and therefore is pure profit. Title IV, Section 111 says that the United States consents to income tax for its employees and corporate officers. And that, and that, and Go that, on before course, then. That's, of course, uh, then a contractual <coughs> agreement to pay taxes uh, rather than, uh, you know, the application of a statute for without the contra element of contract. Well, that's put in their contract for them. Yeah. I have a quick question. Right? Sure. Um, 
back in the mid '90s. I was involved in a group here. I don't think it's around anymore. <coughs> but a guy came up with some documentation from. It's not the tax law, but it was laws back in 1869, where it showed that <coughs> federal government employees had to pay a three percent. <coughs> yeah, but that was the tax on the reserves. Before that, it was 1864. But you know, there, there's. We're not talking about. You know, historically, you can examine the taxes of the Civil War era, yeah. and because there's a lot of related parallels, uh, you know, the documentation that they're talking about is in reference to withholding, uh, you know, I think that the, the argument really back then was, you know, it was based on statute that there was this distinction they were only engaged in withholding on government employees. Uh, but, you know, all of that, that's historical. You know, I use certain parts of the Civil War stuff to reach certain conclusions. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't, I don't study the civil. Is that kind of like the beginning of all this income tax? Well, I mean, you know, to me, uh, but I haven't the, seen any record. You know, any, any time you engage in fiat, you're going to have a fiat a monetary system. You got to suck up that excess credit from the economy. You got to have a way of taking something from everybody. Yeah. To maintain the value of the credit. <laughs> so well, an income tax performs that that function. Well, one and thing. so they were. They they knew that they were going to come out with paper to finance the Civil War. So she better come up with an income tax, and they did. Well, and one you know, thing. had different features. You know, wasn't as sophisticated as what we have today. Yeah. <coughs> well, one thing that's interesting to examine in this connection is the gift tax, because I would say that vacation pay, sick pay, bonuses, and all that are gifts. They're not compensation <coughs> for anything. Well, yeah, that's, so, that would be a, an argument, but we're, we're not even to that stage yet because, you know, it, it's quite possible that the government is sitting there telling us, hey, wages are sick leave, you know, vacation pay, severance pay. I think it's a real good argument. And, but because we're over here, uh, we, we haven't even progressed to addressing those issues. You can make those arguments. Our contention would be, hey, that's, you know, we, we do have a basis of vacation pay, but you know, we haven't even resolved the question of the taxability of <coughs> compensation for labor, John. Yeah, but I would say that the same analysis shows that gifts are not income. True. And yet the government is treating them as though they were a gain. Yeah. Mr. Beecraft? Yeah. Why is it you suppose, and if you look on the 2012 website of the IRS now, W2, W2, 1099s, and all those are class five, which are gifts to the state? Why is well, uh, I'll tell you this. You know, I, uh, I was educated by Wayne Benson, you know, 25 years ago, about 6209. You know, you can draw certain conclusions about, uh, you know, like tax class and everything else. You can draw certain conclusions. You know, there are some interesting things about the way that the IRS, oh, God, I gotta keep doing that. There are interesting things about how the IRS keeps its books and records, you know, computerized books and records. And I don't think that, you know, we would probably benefit if we had somebody on the inside that could teach us something more than, you know, our people sitting down and looking at 6209. But uh, I don't think you sit there and, and draw straight conclusions that the law operates in a certain fashion from the way that the IRS, you know, the conclusions we draw from the way that the IRS keeps its books and records. And, you know, even though, you know, you, you might want to make, make an argument about, you know, certain tax classes, you know, they, this is this is this oddity, you know, we haven't really, I, I wouldn't want to sit there and based on 6209, and you know, tax class or something, then draw a conclusion that's the way the law operates. So they could say, well, tax yeah. class, we move it over to this yeah. column, whatever. But I, you know, I, uh, employment, as far as I'm concerned, based on, you know, and I've studied it all the way back to the beginning, as I suggested here, the you know, employment taxes are uh, a method of, of collecting uh, the income tax from whoever is an employee. And so it, it, statutorily, it's directly related to a feature of the income tax. Can I ask you a question so, about jurisdiction? Sure. Can I ask you a question about jurisdiction? All right. In your opinion, where would my body have to be domiciled 
for this, to all this, all this, to apply to me, my body. When you say all this, you talk about like the income tax? Just there, everything you're talking about. <clears throat> well, I think that there's uh, a dip. You know, one of the reasons why I think it's important for people to engage in word searches is... Um, Did you say word? Searches? Word searches. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, that, and I don't know what Steve's got on the, the regs disk, but, you know, I created, okay, here we go. I, 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 let me get over to it. Can I bring up a point about what you just said? Yeah. If you go to uscode.house.gov, that's the Office of Law Revision Council, mm -hmm. and they have a search engine on there. And if you search the code for, and you got to put it in quotes, because if you don't, you'll get a hundred zillion hits. But if you search for income tax collected at source at uscode.house.gov, Office of Law Ridge Council, you'll only get three hits. And all yeah, three titles. You're, are you reading Zoe's website? No, I'm, this is, I developed this search okay. on my own. It's in the, one of the pamphlets right, okay. I gave you. Yeah, uh, uh, Zolt is a friend of mine. He's got what is taxed and who is taxed at one of those websites. And it's the same thing, you know. You, you know, I, I, I have my own personal idiosyncrasies. I kind of like doing word searches, not Boolean searches, but, you know, word searches in PDFs. But it's interesting because in, in uh, if you look at income tax collected at source, that specifically <coughs> has to do with the way the 16th Amendment is worded. True. And I'll tell you if you do, if you take a look at, at if, if you'll understand the employment taxes when you take a cold hard look at the employment taxes, going all all the way back to the beginning, and after you just move forward into time, you know the only the only conclusion is that you'll reach is wow the world is really screwed up. And it's interesting because the only people that are liable <laughs> is the employer. Employer, yeah. And but, but who is the employer? 3403. What is the citizenship status? You tell me, what's the citizenship status of an employer? The employer, I think, that I believe it's referring to is the one described in Title IV, Section 111, which says the United States consents to income well, tax. Well, you know, you're, 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 you're reaching outside of the tax stuff to reach a conclusion. Absolutely. Why don't you, why don't you go over to the tax stuff and, and see if you... Uh, based upon that, reach that same conclusion. Why don't I was, they put that in Title 26, won. though? Instead huh? of, why, don't they say, why don't they say in Title 26 the United States consents to income tax, but it's in Title 4, the government title? Because it's a function of government. It's their prerogative to do to either approve right. or not. But my argument is, well, then where's the, where's the section of law that makes private sector employees liable for income tax? Well, that's or private sector employers. Yeah. That's another good uh, search. You go to... Uh, if you go to the U.S. House, uh, U.S. Code website and search it for I, I did made all liable, that. is liable, shall be liable. I did all that. It's too. easy to find. There's no, there's nothing there that makes me liable. Right. I got all the search results at is home. Is it an important Not question here. of where we're yeah. domiciled? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it really, it really is. I think it's a good question. It, it, it absolutely is. However, all I'm still telling you, it, I don't know whether Steve's got this, uh, but I have it on my hard drive. You know, I, I just uh, take all the. You know, like I'll take this right here. This is a folder that has the 2003 regs. You know, I've got uh, I got the 1997, 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. <clears throat> you know, all those volumes of tax regulations, which are, you can pull down off from a government website. But for uh, 2003, what I used is I strung together all of the Part One regs. You know. You can either certain have 13 or 14 different searches. You know, I like to do things the lazy way. I just combined it all into one 10,060-page document, all the regulations. And so now, do the advanced search. Let's not do that. Let's do that. Wow, that's a lot of hits. <laughs> but look at that, look at that. Crap. And those are the, and the regs, right? Yeah, this is just regs. Which is equivalent to CFR. <laughs> yeah, the Code of Federal Regulations, that's what this is. I call it regs. Citizen resident? Are they the same? Down the south. Down the south. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. You know, 
you're going to find under section 871 regulations if you want a definition of residence and domicile go over there. Domicile, <coughs> a resident is somebody that goes to, a, 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 has a separate domicile. You know, I'm domiciled in Alabama. I, I'm here in Austin. If I stayed here for a while, for a couple months to do something, I'd be a resident. But my domicile would be in Alabama. That's what. Right. And domicile but you would not citizen. be a citizen of Texas. No, I wouldn't. But, you know, a citizen of America, an American citizen can go anywhere in, in any of the states and just like that. With, with what's Make your, a determination that he's going to become a citizen of the state. What's your point that? of uh, national, American national versus American? <clears throat> hey, look, a national is a guy from the insular possessions. An insular possessions. You mean like Puerto Rico and or it, Guam yeah. or something? Well, there, you, you, you got to look at Title Eight. Some of the insular possession dudes have been made citizens, you know, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. I think the only possible nationals you can have today are Swain's Island, and you know I've, I've got it here on. But okay, all right, you bring it up. You bring it, it up. Is there American? American? No, I don't think. Look, well, hey, let me look. Well, nationals include citizens, but not all nationals are citizens. Well, you can be a national, an American abroad, can be viewed by other countries as a national, we would be classified as a national. But here internally, I'm sure as hell not a national. Yeah, by the way, it's useful in uh, arguing. Right there, look. Okay, uh, let me see. Let's be real specific since it's been brought up. Uh, I got a few. That would be the uh, baseball team, right? <clears throat> That was a joke. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's because we're on this little thing. That's word. Yeah. Well, then I got. I got. Still got a view. Zoom. I got. Maybe that'll do it. Let's see. Residents of the Northern Mariana Islands who did not elect to become U.S. citizens. Oh, oh, okay, here we go. Ah, here we are. The following are the only persons classified as U.S. nationals. Persons born in American Samoa and, or Swains Island. And the Northern Marianas where they do not elect to become a U.S. citizen. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, are the only nationals we have in this country. But inherently, so they get to choose. however, a statute can come along and say, oh, wherever the word national applies here, it will include citizens or nationals. So, you, you, But inherently, you know, this word national didn't get its start until the first time you find it in, in the law is in the 20s. It's just kind of a new term that came up which has been used in the international community, but the inherent nature of a national is somebody that's in the national possessions. And so we have a whole bunch of patriots running around saying, oh, I'm a national, I'm a national, I'm a oh, oh. I think that's, that's, that's dangerous. What about uh, dual citizenship after World War II? There was a lot of that as we had our services, our forces headquartered, or not, or stationed overseas. <coughs> well, I don't know. Mom and dad have a baby in Germany yeah. or Panama Canal. Yeah. They have dual citizenship up until they're 21, or how does that work? I've, I've never looked into that. I have no idea. So can I ask my question again? Sure. So where does my body need to be domiciled for the United States government and all these agencies to have any kind of jurisdiction over me? Is well, domicile and resident are two different uh, things. I'm just asking you domicile. Domicile is where you have an intention to live right. currently. So where does that told you my, need to be domiciled? My, my, my domicile is my house well, I understand that. in Westville, Alabama. You. Your domicile but is I'm what? asking you, where does my body need to be domiciled well. for any of this to uh, have effect on me? Well, any of this is the problem. But that okay, is, let me see. United States government, Internal Revenue Code, and the FDA. Or for well, for any of those congressional powers yes. constitutionally granted, yes, sir. it wouldn't matter where in the in the 
the United States, meaning the 50 states, you were domiciled. Well, the United and States is not the 50 states. If it's that's one of the definitions is the 50 states. There's, well, there's four definitions. Generally right. speaking, what is subject to the jurisdiction of the United States are all states and territories, possessions, protectorates, leaseholds, the grounds of foreign embassies abroad, U.S. flag vessels at sea, and the coastal waters uh, going out to whatever <coughs> distance we assert these days. But that is still subject to further limitations on the subject matter of jurisdiction. But generally speaking, subject to the jurisdiction applies to all that territory. Now, of course, the government has also been asserting jurisdiction for some subjects on the U.S. <coughs> citizens abroad, like tax for tax, or uh, in a few cases uh, for uh, uh, international crimes, uh, uh, the law offenses against the law of nature, piracy. So, are you saying? Are you saying that the United States government has jurisdiction over you, <coughs> where you sit right here? Well, did you? Yes. Did you? You didn't come yesterday, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, we covered yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Generally speaking, well, I mean, there are, yes, there are no, three no, kinds you? of jurisdiction. No, I didn't ask you that. Or do you have? Does the United States government have jurisdiction over you, where you sit right now? Yes, for some subjects. For what? For, for taxes. Uh, for some taxes, could be not others. But remember, there are three kinds of jurisdiction: subject matter, called subjectum; territorial jurisdiction, meaning locum; and personal jurisdiction, personum. All three jurisdictions must be established in order to bring a defendant into court. Personal. Territorial and subject matter. Subject matter. What's in rem? In rem, in rem is, is on the thing, you know, like uh, so admiralty. You know, there's a lot of stuff in, the, in our movement where people are talking about admiralty, which is a lot of it's crazy. So, so yeah. But in rem is operating on a, a thing, and it's typically an in rem action is pursued. You grab, if you grab the thing, like a ship, mm -hmm. the, you know, there's another expression, you know, when it relates to men, you know, <laughs> grab certain parts. But if you grab a, a ship, you're typically the owner will follow. And so Admiralty likes to acquire jurisdiction uh, the, through in rem means, grab the grab the thing, and the owner will follow. So there's something there then. I mean, that, well, it's right? really a kind that, of a that was developed for for seizing ships and stuff. Like yeah, that. but that does, doesn't mean, mean that every seizure is, is Admiralty. No. No, but right. there's a, there's a lot of people that will contend that erroneously. But but there's admiralty jurisdiction even to this day. Of, of course, course, yeah. yeah. But it, 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 there is no admiralty jurisdiction right here, contrary to promoters that have gone around here in the last couple of years. But there would be in Houston, the Port of Houston, for instance. There could be. Well, but you know, right. I, I, I tell you, even the Port of Houston is going to be the water, because the piers along. You know, the Supreme Court said this. You know, Supreme Court has made a <laughs> distinction between a crane on a ship unloading cargo would be an admiralty, but a crane on the dock unloading the ship is not. Now that's pretty. That's cutting things pretty, pretty yeah. close. But then you know the the, the uh, admiralty promoters to run around. Wow, they're going to say that you know I'm sitting here or I could be in the high desert. And, Whoa, this is admiralty. But that makes Which sense is crazy. because that would be a Japanese ship with a Japanese crane on that ship unloading American goods. <coughs> Hits some lady pushing a cart and then, you know, Well, but she, you know, the, 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 the popular contentions about Admiralty are, uh, I'll just say, insane. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing Admiralty, you know, even though that it might be a river of tar out there, there isn't anything, there isn't anything Admiralty about Highway 71 or Ben White or whatever you're going to call it. And there isn't anything admiralty about this this hotel. And a lot so of the areas that had uh, did have admiralty jurisdiction to the United States, they've you know ceded it to the states, like New York Harbor. That was one of the examples yeah. that Larry used yesterday. New York Harbor, they've given up. The federal <coughs> government's given up their jurisdiction. Oh, good. Excuse me. Well, isn't that them. as crazy as them saying uh, because of a certain uh, field floods in a farmer's ground that that's wetlands and and no, that's treaty based. 
Let's go back to this yes, question. Let's go back to this a so, second. Do you gentlemen, can you gentlemen give your opinion, the two attorneys and John, if the IRS has those three jurisdictions over uh, my body sitting here well, right it, here it, today? It depends on what it is. Well, you're, you're right. As, now, as you sit here right now, you're not within the jurisdiction of the United States. But if you uh, if you open a whiskey distillery in your backyard, well, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so, so it depends. You can't just okay. the, right. they don't exist unless you're doing something that allows the jurisdiction. Well, I'm just sitting here. I'm just not. No. You know, so why do we chickens. call them the IRS? I'm raising though. my chickens. Why don't we call them the entity formerly known as the IRS? And make that an official label because that's what the treasury order says. Well, I know, but you know, the popular mind is if you want to get technical, but the popular mind. You, you, you're going to lose somebody if you went around and but engaged in conversation with them. The Treasury order called, it says the entity, look it up, Treasury oh. Order 150-06. Mm -hmm. It's right there. I'm not making that stuff up. That's an active <laughs> Treasury order today. It hasn't been rescinded. That's where they were, they were abolished. The designation was abolished, not the <laughs> entity. Yeah. So let's call it the entity because that's what it is. If we call it the Internal Revenue Service, we're giving credence to something that doesn't you're, exist. You're, you're, you're right. Hey, we, we've got to we've got to go out and affect the uh, <coughs> the American people. We got to get them to look at some of this stuff. Can we do that? Can't wake we, up. Well, can't we do that in a court of law? Can't we sue and say objection, Your Honor? They're most, not the IRS. Most people are don't know or care what happens in courtrooms. I don't care about most people. The judges do. I know, but we, if we're going to reach the American people, we have to be able to take the message to them in a way that they can understand. And a court of victory would do that? Only if they know about it. Well, yeah. then you tell them. Well, and I got another thing. Yeah. court's not going to give you a victory in a tax matter. No How matter about the subject, all right? these? Well, one reason we're never going to get rid of this crap is because there's a cottage industry of billions and billions of dollars developed around the fraud. Right? Yeah, yeah, There's too yeah. many people right. being paid off. So if you can start suing third parties for using these eternal revenues, uh, IRS, you know, we can get hey, you out of an IRS. I'll, I'll tell you this. There's a lot of good ideas. I talk to everybody in the movement has a, well, let's do this, let's do that. I have my own long list of let's do this. And, you know, there's a lot of real good things we do. Okay, here's one. people to do them. When right. you file your yeah. income tax form, you're violating federal law. How's that one? Because you're violating 6091, it says you shall file in the Internal Revenue District where you live or where you work. That's paraphrasing it. I agree, but that's what it says. It says you shall. <coughs> in legal parlance, doesn't that, that mean 99% of the time mean must? Well, then they, they also suggest compel you to file at the service centers by means of the unpublished uh, uh, the rules that appear in the 1040 instruction book. But if the Secretary of Treasury could hand out exemptions to certain things, <coughs> like they've been handing out exemptions to health care, yeah. left and right. I want an exemption for violating that, that law that says i got to file the Internal Revenue District where I live, because they got rid of the damn districts illegally, in the district director position, illegally, because uh, IRS RRA 98 says it's a congressional mandate at that section of code that the district director needs to approve in personal writing on certain levies. And that's, Congress said that. And uh, there's that AM Journal in 1962 that says you can't add or subtract anything with regulation from a statute, otherwise, otherwise the damn thing is invalid. The district director issue is part of what Lindsey Springer is litigating from prison. But Lindsey didn't uh, research our yeah, uh, no, but Lindsay, the Lindsey Springer brought it up. makes uh, a half of an argument. He didn't research it. He didn't say RA He went, he went over my website. You're, what you're talking about and what Lindsay's talking about, he pulled off my website. Well, I didn't pull it off. Well, of yours. I read the law. <laughs> I read the section 3445, and they codified it in 6334. If you look at Title 26, 6334, it still says district director. but that Yeah, the paper. regulations still say that. Yes, but the, treasury, the Federal Register entry changed it to area director. I understand but that. They, but until they change the regulation, it's, <coughs> it's of no consequence. Yeah, Larry. What do you mean it has no yeah. consequence? What, what's the consequence of... Well, hey, look, we're almost... The district director says is in the regulation, but the federal register says... I don't know how long we got this room, right. Steve. I don't know whether we got to vacate at noon or whether so we can hang over. It's but let's kind of wrap things up here. Right, Does anybody have... 
I know, I just got a question. I'm just as confused as hell right now. Maybe you guys can get me straightened out just a little bit. Back five or six years ago, when the bankers were just absolutely outscrewing everybody underneath the sun. When uh, they were? Yeah. <laughs> <A few> people, <laughs> when they, they stop? When they were a shorter <laughs> list. Please. A few people came out and were just called idiots because they said, man, look at all this fraud that's going on. So, sure enough, it gets in the mainstream. A few attorneys get a hold of it now, and all of a sudden, they get fined billions of dollars. They couldn't care less. Nobody goes to jail. And we're going on down the road. Power. Yeah. So, if we're dealing with that same type of power structure here with the IRS and the government, but a whole lot worse, is there any correlation, is there any parallel that can be used with the bankers to try to get some semblance of justice here? And I say no. You know? We have no right. remedy. There, well, there's no remedy. We, we have a remedy, maybe, but we have no enforcement of that remedy. So It's called the bailout. No. no but, you know, you're, you're <laughs> expressing a, a common view that uh, oppressed people across the world also often speak like you, and just because we got oppression here doesn't mean that we're going to get an instantaneous solution when we're fighting a power structure. I know, but here, here's the point I was going to get into. When we get into that, we get into court. Here, here's just where y'all are, mm -hmm. are looking at. And we get in there, their favorite argument, and you hit it yesterday, well, you know, you're infringing on the power of the judge to make law, well, or something like that. Well, that, I didn't say that. Well, somebody said <laughs> that. That's pretty okay, accurate but, Okay. How dare you follow the law? Making law from the bench. So you have to come up and they say, okay, it's a, frigid, it's a frivolous argument. You know, uh, here's something off the cuff the judge gets. Yeah, I agree. You know, sustain. You know, the judges, how do we get to that point to make these people? Is there any way to make these people well, follow or, the law? This is a <clears throat> corrupt. You know, the it's condition, condition of the courts corrupt. is just, it's, it's just another fact of life it's a feature of what we must be what we're up against it's just like the sun will always rise in the east it always has and always will and we we build our lives around the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west well we got we've got uh, judges that are protecting the system and it doesn't mean that uh, that's a factor that we got to take into consideration regarding what we do but that doesn't mean that we do nothing and, 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 and I, I, I would suggest to you that, you know, just uh, as I said yesterday, look at uh, what the Heller case did. I wouldn't have predicted the, the Heller decision Is that 15 the years health, ago. Health care? <coughs> no, I'm going to hang on. Hang on to Washington, D.C. I'm sorry. <coughs> the Second Amendment stuff. Oh. Second Amendment, just this week, Seventh Circuit comes along and shoots down Illinois stuff. So you, you, there are things that can be done. Uh, Judicially, but I think that we've got to. We need to be in forums where the the court doesn't have a dog in the fight. And when you're in federal court, you know it's a real prejudiced atmosphere. The the, the judges have a dog in the fight because they're protecting the system. I suggest you we go to state courts uh, to raise a lot of important federal tax questions. System well, yeah. well, let's let, let's <coughs> examine one other thing. I. Made well, good hey, use can, of can, can I ask this question, Doc? Sure. It, here it is, almost to the conclusion of our session. Does anybody else want me to show anything, and then we can carry on if we have to be out of here? We certainly can go out there on the patio. Can Does we, anybody want to see anything? We can research that ourselves if we want to run it down. Yes. Yeah. Are we, are we going to talk about just Greg's? No. I, does anybody have something that? I would, yeah, I would like to talk about RRA 98 because I think that's where they really screwed up. <clears throat> you know, because, my and, point that I was trying to make was, because I've raised this issue in many cases for many clients for a number of years now. <coughs> Since the RRA took effect, there has not been a lawful assessment of any tax anywhere in the United States. Period. That I can't agree. happen. Yeah. And... The, but do the judges care? Absolutely not. No, because cause they, their position is, oh, well, the IRS came up with another procedure for that. I know. And so the point is, you know the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing. <coughs> right, expecting different exactly. Results. exactly. But so, that's not the same thing. I've, I've actually highlighted 3445, <coughs> which is a section of code 
in the RRA 98, which says, tells the Office of Law and Revision Council, you will update 6334 right here to say district director. That's congressional mandate. Okay. So they I understand that. I understand that. Okay, but, but the point is, up in trial. the point is that none of these arguments are of, kind of any exactly. use whatsoever in court. Exactly. None of them. Why? Not yours, not anybody's in this room. Why? Because, 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 because you cannot win in court. They will game, not let you. It doesn't matter the merits I, of your argument. I went and got licensed in tax court because I had all these clients I was helping telling me how bad it was. I said, oh, it can't be that bad. Oh, yeah. So I went and got licensed in tax court, and the very first day I stepped foot in the court, I realized this is, this is ten times worse than any of my clients oh, right. ever told yeah. me, and that's the problem. But, but, the, but the solution is don't get in the boat with them to begin with, which is why you know, yeah, if you're going to go to court, if you, have no, if you have no choice but to go to court, all this stuff Larry's telling you yeah. is very valuable because it helps you protect records. But my position is don't go to court and don't get in their system in the first place because the law doesn't require it. Yeah. But there's the a section of code. There's a section of code. There's a section of code. A section of code. Is, a section of code. says it's well settled. I'm going well to go up to PACS. It's got to matter. Otherwise, we don't have any rules. You're exactly right. That's the problem. I do. Huh? Well, this is solution is political. Oh, okay. You will not get a solution in court. This, oh, because of, they're corrupt. Can I get it? Yeah. That's the problem. I agree 100 percent with John. It's, it's done. Well, you have to. You have to. <laughs> hey, top dogs. Over oh, just, just a second. Make them look stupid. You guys can stay and, and talk, but I, me and Larry, have to pack. We got to be on a shuttle to the airport soon. But this room is paid for all day. Okay. For those that want to stay and can talk to each other here, maybe, if you want to, but we'll be <laughs> back. I just want to and, and turn in those things, or you can mail them in if you want to be on that yeah, network that we're putting together. I up a, a point about the uh, classified I have a property that was <laughs> um, Robert Clarkson had, to do had a, a client that went to tax court in a little more advanced today, 2009. And it was an old jurisdiction. Uh, and you said that they uh, were the 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 Basis of treaty. Okay. It's simply asserted and, and, and enforced without any constitutional basis or so, treaty. Hey, I'm, I'm going to go up. Y'all so so stay on the other country just because we're going to go back. If you live in the United States, that's what I want to know. Richard, I heard that. I'm going to go back now. 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 I'm going to go the IRS so financial transactions. You might have an executive agreement that you have the same effect. Right. But it does, it does not bring U.S. citizens under in those countries uh, under our jurisdiction. The treaty doesn't do that. It's just it's just that the, the government says it works. The, 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 the treaty is just applied to discovery. Investigation. That's all. When that happens, the first because what they did is I'll be back in this little property to pack up. So it doesn't matter if this is it. Well look the only value of all of this is in talking to the general public to get them to support candidates and legislation that will change it, that will reform it. The, the whole point of this is political. There is no answer in court. And the only thing we can do in court is lose and thereby demonstrate to the general public 
that we have a problem. And they have to elect different people to Congress. Well, since the uh, Herbert Walker was in the election there's no way to get it. Uh, 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 it's uh, going to be on our side to unless you get the one or two percent, which isn't going to change anything. I don't know if you're about it. Well, two percent, which is actually all we have, which is out of 535, one or two percent is 53. So I think I know people out of the whole 535 can't change anything. So we have, we have to get majorities in both houses of Congress and the presidency. If we don't do that, we're screwed. We have nothing we can do without those majorities. And this week, the Senate majority passed one treaty with the United Nations and it passed four more next week. Yeah. 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 Yeah.